Okay, let's start it. So welcome everyone for today's presentation. Let me introduce our amazing guest. We have Valentin Noves and uh, Pablo Delminger is not gonna be here today for uh, issue at work, but that's gonna be fine. So um, we would like to really thank you for the last time uh, Ideate and Imagine It for the sponsor for the food. Where we want to have the food for the next month, but we are looking for sponsors. So if you guys want to help us providing food, that would be great. So last meetup, we presented this hackathon, the MIT one for the reality. And we would like to show you a couple of winners and also the price. Um, this is their website where you can look who won and also which category. You're gonna see in reality virtually ACK. And uh, you can see it was a really good weekend. They provide a really good price. And there are especially Forge application, ASRI as well. You can see they work really well with the space composing in the in that hackathon. And also with Euphoria, there are really great examples. With Magic Click and Wafer. You can just look here at the website and look at the winner. I strongly recommend to do that. And also maybe next year to participate, why not? Always talking about Hackathon. So we had a special discount for, for the member of this community. If you're also watching online, you can use this 10% off code from the TT Core one that is gonna be in Seattle, the, actually the 29th of March. So they provide a workshop, one day workshop and two day Hackathon. So, for today and this weekend, we really thank uh, our sponsor for the AC Hackathon, Facebook, that is here today with us. And uh, it starts Friday at 6 o'clock. And uh, on Sunday, around uh, 2, they're going to be the presentation for the team. And we have a free ticket um, for, for the member of the audience or also the people online. We have two questions. Where was the first AC Hackathon, the place? And also, if you can name more hackathon as possible, you can then send an email to this address, sfcdagcoordinator at gmail.com, with the answer of these two questions. Where was the first place? And uh, if you can name more hackathon, who is going to answer in the best way? We're going to provide a free ticket for the this weekend hackathon. So we can display the result at the end of this meeting, if we're going to be, or further. So take a note about that. Another special event uh, is uh, Topologic. It's going to be the 25th uh, from uh, Vasim Yabi. Maybe some one of you know. He's really combining uh, topological optimization also with a different algorithm that is used for non-manifold topology. Um, and also our cousin, let's say, in the UK, they are organizing another hackathon. Uh, it's going to be the 5th and 6th of April in collaboration with Autodesk Dynamo BM team. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if you are flying in London, that's a good event to, to attend. So talking about us, about what we are currently organizing, we are providing to you a community workshop. It's this Python community workshop. And we have already a few results from uh, the questionnaire we send out. So as you can see here, the main, uh, yeah, definitely. the main focus, uh, is going to be about uh, actually architecture. So we are going to probably be focused on architecture and maybe some uh, example. There are also 24% about BIM. There are geophysics as well and landscape architecture. The other question that you can still answer to this question because we're going to uh, meet this Friday in order to decide to provide the best workshop as possible. What is your level of expertise using Dynamo? We see a pretty good level, I would like to say. Other people say seven. And uh, what programming language uh, have you used before? S several people are using Python. I think it's one of the most common languages for our environment. How is that this workshop could affect your work? So basically, it's a really good variety of answer. Basically, it's going to be streamlining BIM. And what is preferred structure? So I think it's the answer is pretty clear, a combination of sample, project, and fun fundamentals. So it's going to be a specific day we put out. You can find the ticket in Eventbrite. Now we open the early bird ticket. 
and you can also direct it. It's gonna be the May 11th. It's gonna be a Saturday. We're gonna start at nine, around nine. And uh, I would like to really thank you all, uh, the main uh, organizer that is here. You can, Danny Bentley from SOM, also Dennis. You can find all this information for our tutor. If you want to look online, they have a really great uh, tutorial as well as Python. And uh, these are gonna be the main tutor that are gonna provide this amazing workshop in May. So big applause for them for all this volunteer work that they want to do. So if you are a student, uh, there is this great opportunity. We would like to have your CV and portfolio so we can uh, provide a free workshop for some of you for the best one. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. Let's start it. If uh, you want to take note about the future event, uh, I would like to remember that we are gonna be always the third Wednesday of every month. It's gonna be here at AIA. If we have a special location, we're gonna advise you on time. So the next one is gonna be uh, Ted Selker, and he's a professor at MIT that work with MagicLip. And then we have Stephanie Tab that is gonna is part of a SOM, and she's gonna present something related to deep learning. And then probably we're gonna have this special anniversary party at Autodesk and Unity. So we are collaborating with them to really provide the best anniversary. Okay. So finally, we can start it with the main presentation. I'm really thrilled to introduce you to Valentin Noves and their great work they're doing with Engine. So okay. welcome to the stage. Uh, first, thanks to Alberto and Cesar for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and present this software to you guys. Um, first of all, and a spoiler alert, if you like accents, that's good because you're gonna be listening for with an, to an accent for a while now. So, let me put this here. Yeah, there we go. So first. Um, First, before we start with Engine, I'm part of a company called ENG Works. We're a company that we have several offices across uh, South America and the US. We have a couple of uh, people in UK, Middle East, and Australia, but those are just commercial offices. Right now, we have more than 15 years of experience, more than 140 BIM uh, professionals, uh, which right now it says 10, but it, now it's right, right now almost 15 software developers and more than 1,300 projects completed. So now let's begin. Uh, let us just show you what's the design process that we use for all the, all the programs that we develop in our company. First things first. So we all want to innovate. All companies want to innovate. That's that's something for sure. Like nobody will say, like, no, I just like the old stuff. I don't want to innovate in my company. And and the answer is pretty clear. Like we all like to innovate because you get a competitive advantage, whether it is on price, whether it is on the time it takes you or whatever. That's that's the goal. Why you innovate? And you always have like pretty much two options. Like I can innovate using new processes. For example, I can use Dynamo and develop a new script that is gonna automate or, or model something really super cool in my computer. Or I can go also on the side of the technology. Like I can uh, build my own software or something that's just pure technology, zero process. And then what we decided in our company is go for the technology side because technology allows us to do so many crazy and incredible things. Why? Let's see a couple of examples like uh, 3D printing. 3D printing was created and until now we're trying to see how we use it. Like every day we see new uses for 3D printing. The same with augmented reality. Like everybody's talking about augmented reality but like it's been here for a couple of years now and we're still trying to see how we're gonna use it. So. It happens many times that the technology is developed and then 
the processes are adapted to the, the new technology, like quantum computer, IoT, blockchain, um, machine learning. Those are all technologies, like, like machine learning is a really good example. It has been here for more than 10 years, and now it's a boom. Right now, we're able to use it. So right now, that's why our main focus is on technology in the innovation side of our company. So what's, what I'm telling you this, because right now, most of the things that we do in our company are beam coordination processes. Like uh, I've been watching screens with Navisworks and complex models for years now. So we started thinking like, okay, if beam coordination is our main processes, no matter if it is for architects, engineers, contractors, owners, or whatever, why not develop something specifically to improve the beam coordination workflows? So the second thing we took into account is like, the things that are improving those workflows right now are the visual programming languages like Dynamo, Grasshopper, or even all the programming languages like DigiLogic or Red Notes, which are like really all visual programming languages. Are the ones that are, they're not used a lot in the construction industry, but those are like the most popular all over the world. So we combine that, like the idea of how to improve the beam coordination process and the idea on how to apply the visual programming technology on these processes. And in December, we came to this. Basically, this was the first version of our software. Um, it was the alpha. We call it the alpha at the beginning. And it was just a visual programming language for Navisworks. Uh, it did really cool things. You were able to automate all your processes, take information from here to Revit, and do cool stuff. But we, we, at the beginning, we even call it the Dynamo for Navisworks. And, and really, honestly, we started thinking after a month, we developed that. And it was like, really? Really are we going to do this? Another Dynamo? We're like, that, that's Dynamo for, we love Dynamo. We think it's an awesome tool. Why on earth we are gonna do another one? So we were not amazed. We were like, oh man, let's do something that we can feel proud of. So we started thinking again. We, we said like, okay, we're not gonna continue with this. So we started thinking like, first, what, what makes a program great? We wanted to start from that, from the scratch. What makes a program great? So we just went to the, to the ISO, uh, which tell us, tells you what to do, what your software needs to have in order to be great. So it's functionality, reliability, usability, efficiency, and so on. But that, that's like, it's like when someone asks you or on, on what's, what's going to be like your ideal partner. You're always going to say like, oh, I want him or her to be pretty, to be fun, to be interesting. Yeah, but those are like the stuff that we all say, right? So then again, we said like, ah, let's take this out and start thinking what makes a program unique? What, what is gonna make today the program awesome for all the, the, the beam professionals out there? So first things first, we did a survey. A boring, really long survey. And we started with the more than 100 professionals that we had in our company. And there was a really good start. Then we continued with a couple of our partners and we ended up with more than 250 surveys, which was a really, really good and number, but pretty boring process. And after that survey, um, we filter and we ended up with three characteristics that your program needs to have. First one, professionals thinks, think that it needs to be either customizable or programmable also. So, I should be able to modify the interface. I should be able to, to do whatever I want to, to custom made it to me. What they, what they say is that instead of just being a mere user, like I'm just 
using the tools you provide me, I'm, I'm going to be, I need to be able to do whatever I want to customize and adapt the program to my workflows. To actually feel that you're experimenting, that you're creating crazy and unique things. Second thing, it needs to be collaborative. Like right now, all the latest tools are collaborative, like uh, collaboration for Revit, even, even Google Docs, it's live, 100% live. So people is asking for that even more in projects as big as the construction projects. Good example is, um, and don't get me wrong, Dynamo is also more Grasshopper or, or whatever, but if you want to visualize someone else's workflow, the hmm. only way you can do it is in a computer. Uh, you can, it's really uncomfortable and, and be using Dynamo in the cell phone. I've never done that. And the other problem is that that's a desktop solution. So you cannot access the same file that you're using and, and watch it live. You cannot do it. So we need a software that allows, allows us to work and create like workflows together. The other problem is the transfer. Like right now, if I need to create a, a script, Dynam script or Grasshopper script, a DigiLogic script or whatever, I have to save it, send the file to the, to the other user. The other user is going to modify it and he's going to send it back to me. That's like AutoCAD was like 20 years ago. We, we don't need that anymore. We need something that we are going to access and we know it's the latest and greatest. And third, the interoperability. If you think about it, right now, most of the programming languages are not like <coughs> specifically for tools that we use every day, like Navisworks, AutoCAD. I know everybody is talking about this, like everybody's saying like, we need to use Revit, but let's let's be honest. Like most users right now, they still use AutoCAD, and there is no solution for that. Navisworks is the same. Autodesk, it's an awesome solution, and Autodesk is saying like we're not updating it because we are gonna put it online. But that's not here yet. It's gonna take a couple of years for them to have like an actual Navisworks online. It's not here yet, so we need support for that or Unity. Everybody's talking about Unity and how, how we can do cool stuff with Unity. We don't have a visual programming language for that, not at all. Tecla, another example, like I know most of the talks, like Dynamo talks are between architects or owners, or but we always forget about the structural engineers, for example. They all like to use Dynamo as well. And, um, and there is certain compatibility, but it's like you need to start from Revit and then take it, take it from Tecla. So, same from Syncro and same from Forge. And the other thing is there are, for sure, there are exceptions and there are really good solutions outside, but many of them are just one-to-one. -one. The data is not centralized. Good example is if I want to take something from Revit to uh, Grasshopper and mix it with Excel in the middle, I have to take it from one software to the other and then the, the, the third software. It's it's not a centralized way. So the other thing is like the professionals said that they don't want like all paths all over the place and need to be installing one plugin here, one plugin there. One, they just want something simple and it's centralized, completely centralized. Good thing is like if you don't want centralized, you can just go from here to there and continue working as you were working before. It's fine. So after all that, we decided to start a journey and take all that information and apply it in a completely new project. And that's how Engine was born. Engine, it's a cloud platform that uses visual programming language. It's a means to an end. It's not the whole core of the software. The whole core of the software is that you have you will have centralized data. Basically, our goal is to provide an exciting user experience, filling the gaps between all the programs in the industry. That's our main goal right now. So, what are the main features? First, you're going to have a user session. So, 
you're going to be able to access. You're not only going to be able, able to manage all your projects. Let's say you develop like 100 scripts. You're going to be able to create folders and, 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 and see the properties of the folders. So like, oh, OK, I'm going to click this folder. Oh, this is shared with Jenny. Oh, and this is shared with this other client. And I'm going to be able to manage all my information there. Also, you're going to be able to have like a really good market where you're going to be able to get all the scripts that other users are uploading to the platform. And you're always going to have the latest and greatest. You will not have to deal with revisions or things like that anymore. Second thing, it's agnostic. It's completely agnostic. We are not married with any software. You want to, in the future, you want to, I don't know, you use SAP, you want to combine it with this, you're going to be able to do it. That's the idea. We provide a platform, you connect it. That's it. Storage. Like, and I'm not talking about models of storage, I'm talking about databases. You're going to be able to have as many databases as you want there. What's the purpose of this? Let's say I have 100 models, BIM models in my company. I can extract the data from those models and put it there all together in just one place, filter it or do whatever I want or share it with clients, whatever I want. And then it's collaborative. The idea is that this is going to be 100% live. I'm going to move a node and the other guy on the other side of the world is going to be able to see that I moved that node instantly. instantly. So let me jump a little bit. Just going to access the platform right now. Well, just creating a project. Basically, this is just the canvas. I've jumped through the user session right now because we are working on it. And basically, it's pretty similar as other visual programming languages at the, at the beginning. You even click a node, you get the information of your node here. Uh, you, you can connect them and, and so on. Let's jump to any other project. I can do whatever I want. It's the, the, the important for, uh, for us is that it's super simple. And it's just the canvas, it's just divided in three parts. Those are the basically the nodes, the canvas, and then the properties. That's it. That's it. And then if you want to customize it, you want to add icons, you want to, you're going to be able to do whatever you want. You want to, you want to do square nodes instead of rounds. Yeah, you're going to be able because that's the first question we always get. Like, seriously, like round round nodes. Yeah, like you're going to be able to change it. So if you want a triangular nose, you're going to be able to do it. So it's fine. So how technical it is? How is how is the how is this work? So pretty much we have divided in two parts, basically the front end and the back end. The front end is divided in two as well. First part is a user session and a complete different model is the canvas, the workflows, which is all writing in JavaScript. And then all the back end, which is the storage and the, the proxy that links, makes a link between all the different programs and, and the workflows and the user session, it's all writing in C sharp, basically the dognet technology. So one of the first questions that we get is do I have to learn another visual programming language again? Like Ready, learn Grasshopper. Ready, learn Dynamo. I have to learn another one? Good thing is no. We have an extremely awesome compatibility with Dynamo nodes and Grasshopper. Or you can even create your custom nodes if you want to. Good example is this video. So pretty much, if you see there on the left, there are just three categories of nodes. What we are doing right now, it's just we're pasting. You see the DS. That was a little bit fast. Right, let's go again. 
Um, oh. There you go. You see, that's the DSE core notes, the DLL, DLL for all the Dynamo notes. We just copy, paste it in the engine folder, and boom, you have all the Dynamo notes instantly. So you don't have to do it again. That's the idea, you see? Now you have the Dynamo core nodes inside engine. So for the Dynamo users, it's gonna be like you're using the same interface. But then there is another question, like why? Why on earth visual programming languages users are so few? Like if you compare the Dynamo users with all the Revit users and the Tecla users, Navisource and so on and so forth, like it's a real small percentage. Like we all Dynamo, it's, we all agree on that Dynamo, Grasshopper, it's, those are awesome solutions, but there is only a small percentage which are using that. The same happens in, in our company, we have 140 people and, and it's a small percentage. Why, why on earth? So again, we started doing a survey, uh, analyzing the market and, and, and trying to see why is that happening? So we found that there are three potential users for the programming languages. First one, Beam users, like Revit users, AutoCAD users, Navisworks users, that they are not using uh, Dynamo or Grasshopper. They are not using any programming languages right now, right? So those are really big potential users. Then, visual programming languages users, like nothing to talk about here. Like there's, these are guys that they already know how to use Dynamo. It's, it's, we need to convince them. And then programmers. That's, that's, those are the other animals that they don't like to use Dynamo. Like there are so many like engineers that they don't like to use Dynamo and it's what's happening. Why on earth is that happening? If supposedly it's gonna make the, their life easier. So we found that on this side, these guys, they like the beam users, they have many excuses. Like it's too difficult. Uh, I don't have time to learn something new, which both are valid. I, I don't know, I'm lazy, uh, whatever. They all, we, we had so many excuses from these, these guys. So it's like, okay, those are all valid, valid excuses. We're gonna take that feedback. <clears throat> and then on the other side, the programmers. The programmers were like, Dynamo, what? No, I just like to open Visual, Visual Studio and start coding. I don't like any graphic stuff or I just like, because we think it's slower. We think uh, it's not scalable. We, we don't think it's the best solution. And okay, it's, it's a good feedback as well. So how to bring what we have right now combined with what all, all those all two users need, right? That was a big challenge. So this is an engine, this is just a, a really simple script. These are all the clashes that I have in a Navisworks model. Um, basically what we do is we, we group clashes. You only have to put two inputs, like, like per area. How many group of clashes do you want? If you put one, everything is gonna, group in, 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 is gonna be grouped in one clash. If you put, put two, like if the building is gonna be split in two parts and it's gonna be just two group clashes and so on and so forth. And then the other one is just the iteration of the how many times you want the algorithm run, running. So good thing is, let me stop here. If you see this, it's like, well, but that's exactly the same as do the other programming languages. What are you talking about? What did you do to improve and get new users? So we did this. If you put, you press that button there in the interface there, you click it and boom. You don't have a Dynamo code, a visual programming language anymore. Now you have a form. It's an online form, which what it has in those two boxes are the inputs that you need to put. The group clashes is the title of the script that you, you have, and then a run button. Why is this good? Because every time you do this, it creates a unique website. So then the only thing you have to do is share this unique website with someone and it's gonna go directly to the form. So 
you, you don't need to be a, a piece of programming language user at all. And if, if you don't even have inputs, just press run. You don't care. It connects automatically with your Rabbit or your Navisworks. You don't have to install anything. This is awesome with subcontractors. For example, we work all the time with clients uh, telling them like, hey, can you do this, this, run this or that? And they're always like, what? I don't know. Or, oh, the, 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 the node that I'm using, it's the previous revision. It's not working. What's happening with this? This is all the past. This is always going to be uh, the most updated version. So the guy, the only has to thing to do is just run. He just has to enter the website and run. That's it. Oh, I missed something here. He's not gonna. Be, go, he's not gonna see the, the engine interface or anything. It's just gonna be that form. And you can even lock it so the guy is not able to modify your nodes. That's a good thing as well. So what else? Because this is not helping the programmers at all. So then we have the JS button there. So if you click it there, you're going to be able to visualize all the JavaScript front end code directly in your interface online. So you're just going to be able to compile online what you're seeing there. So if you know JavaScript, you're going to be able to use it. Or on the other side, that's a C sharp button. If you know C sharp, you're going to be able to click C sharp, compile online, and modify your notes online. So we are bringing the programmers here. Then after that, um, this is an example of how you create for, for you guys, the ones who like to program. This is just an example of the substructure of a node in engine, which is like super, super simple. The only things that you have is like the category and subcategory is the way that's going to be filtered in the in the left of the, it's just the selection tree. And then here, just put the, the description. You put, um, the, the name and the description, and then just put the output. That's it. This, the, the, the C-sharp structure is super easy, and that's the idea. If you're going to be able to compile it online, you need like, you even, you even can be like a really beginner programmer, know a little bit of C-sharp. The only thing is press the bottom and start coding. You need to like configure all your Visual Studio or doing like crazy things that are going to be like a little bit difficult. Then let's let's watch a couple of demos or examples of things that we're using right now. Uh, before it starts, this is screen here. This is engine. Uh, this is screen here running. It's Revit, and this is Navis Works, and these are all clashes. The red colors and the green colors are things that are clashing, as you know. Pretty straightforward. So you can just run it. Use the Revit tab as well. And then boom. All your elements in the Revit model are the same core. All the elements that are clashing are red in the in the in the Revit model now. Um, you can even like if you want to, you can even tell tell Revit to create one view per element that is clashing in your model. And then you can even run a script to delete those after you fix them. So what's the good thing about this? Let's say you are the beam coordinator. You're going to run, extract this information. Good thing is everything's online. So then you're just going to send it to your subcontractor and tell him, like, just enter this website and press run with your Revit open, right? And everything is going to be painted automatically red. All the elements are clashing. So that's how we're going to help all the, the, the different parts that are involved in the coordination process. Oh. Another good example is this one. This is Navisworks. This is the timeliner for the, let me stop it for a second. This is a timeliner. This is just a time simulation. This is just a, the project that we use. It's in Blue Beam, but it's a project that we use to fit the timeliner. There is engine down there. And there is Revit right here. Oh, 
Oop. So what we are doing, we're just extracting the information from Timeliner with Timeliner tab. And then we're going to the Revit tab. We're running it. And there we go. We have a time simulation in Revit. You see, it's gonna it's starting. A little slow we can maybe shrink but that's just a configuration we can shrink the time you want to do it slower or faster and then you are reflecting the same timeline that you have there in Navisworks you can reflect it there in your Revit because many times like you only have Revit you don't have Navisworks it's fine you can just extract the information from the guys who has Navisworks and run it in your Revit that's fine another example is this that's Dynamo there, that's Revit, that's um, Navisworks, and this is Engine here on the, on the right bottom. So what we are doing here is, let's say we model that kind in Dynamo, what we are doing is taking that kind and putting it in Navisworks. First thing you're gonna say is, well, that's something I can already do. What are you saying, dude? So. What I'm saying is now I'm gonna save that shape. I will have now a profile with all the shapes that I want. I wanna save a grain, it's gonna be saved there. You wanna save whatever you think you wanna add to your model in Navisworks, you're gonna save it. And then you're gonna click a drop down and you're gonna choose any pre-saved shape that you want. Good thing is like you can add parameters because we are working with OBG, OBJ. So what we can do there is like, let's say a dot, this or a wall or whatever. The square shapes, I can add parameters or a scale like I'm doing right now with that can. I can add a scale or parameters and I can just quickly know like, boom, give me a, a wall of like two feet of, and I don't know, 30 inches, whatever. I can do it. I can add parameters and I have a pre-shaped form that I can use in Navisworks. So I don't have to, if I wanna know if something is gonna fit there or how it's gonna look or whatever, I can just put it directly from Navisworks. I don't have to go back to Revit, model it in Revit and take it back to Navisworks. And I'm just running it again. So another can appears and so on and so forth. And then this is a really internal use that we have put to engine to use. But I think it's really good one. Oh, let me stop it again. Those these videos they run a little bit fast. So in our company, what we do is we use a software called Mavelink. We use it to track hours. It's super simple. Like if the guy is modeling, I don't know, uh, walls or whatever, he's gonna put like, hey, today I model. I spend like eight hours modeling walls in this project. So that way you can track who's modeling what and how many hours is taking them. Right. So what we are doing here, it's combining the API of Maybelline, taking all that information, uh, information and putting it in Excel. This is just the users, user one, two, three, four, five, six, and the actual hours it took them to model just one project. And then I'm taking the information from the model. It was like many iterations of, of the same model. And, and we took the elements that each model, each user model. So, and then we, so user one took him 165 hours to model 3,215 elements in the model. And then it's just a percentage of how many elements of the total elements in the model did he do, and then a ratio between uh, the elements and the hours. And after that, we took all that information with just one click to Power BI. There we go. By doing so, I can exactly know. Um, you see here, is, these are the six users and uh, the modeling elements by user. How many elements did the user model? The actual hours it took each of the users. Uh, for example, I don't know, like 
user one it took him like more than 160 hours, but it's not the one who modeled more, more elements. It's not like something you say like this is better than this one, but it's start. And then uh, the percentage each user did, and then the ratio. So I can know uh, who was more efficient. I can quickly know uh, that user six was the most efficient. And maybe user six was not the one that spent more hours there. So for one project, you know, we're not, like modelers are not machines. So, but then if you can start like using a database and putting all this information together, you can know that this guy, it's so much better modeling walls and, and, and so much faster for, I don't know, hospitals and casinos. And this guy is so much better for smaller projects and you can get conclusions and, and using all that data to feed the way you work with, with, with your people. So how is gonna how's gonna work? How's this database is gonna work is the same thing that we just did with Maybelline and, and, and Revit. You're gonna be able with the user session to get like let's say one that right now for example we have one database for all the the just the elements the amount of elements and the user. That's it, and and the type of project. That's the only thing that we have in a database, and then the Maybelline information, because we we don't want to take all the data data from Revit because those that database is going to be like huge. When you have more than 100, 200, or 300 BIM projects, it's too much. So we filter it depending on the use that we're going to give that database. So right now, for example, we have that that database, and you're going to be able to just take it to the canvas and modify that data, filter it and do whatever you want, or sending it to another program, sending it to another database. For example, we, we take all those numbers and we send it to marketing, accounting, or other different parts of our company. Like automatically you can just, you know, send it through an email or whatever, like automatically, or, or you can even give them access, like the other people in your company to that database, it's, it's fine. Is, is going to be like managed with the user session, so it's not going to be something tedious like opening like an SQL file or something like that, which is like sometimes a nightmare. Or you can even visualize it, wh whatever you want. Another example here is this is a bridge. Uh, this is this was done in Synchro. You know, Synchro is a simulation uh, program. So we're we're do, doing here is we are taking information like the dates that everything was, was go, is going to be built in the simulation. And we take it from there and we put it in uh, Revit. Um, and boom, all those elements are, they have a color now. And if you see, you have the date now, 27th of November or 2018, 9 p.m. Basically, it's just as an example that you can take any information that you want from one software to the other. Another um, good one that we have been just ha having fun actually, it's AutoCAD. Here, what we are doing is we're just taking lines, a bunch of lines that they can they can be walls, ducts, or whatever. And what we just did is we took from Navisworks through Engine and we created a layout of pipes connected. Like th this is something that you can already do with the Revit API. We're, what we are doing just now is just automating that workflow really quickly. So right now, which are the current APIs or connections that we have available? Oh, the ones that we are using and that we're putting a lot of effort are Navisworks, Revit, AutoCAD, Synchro, Dynamo, and Excel. Those are the ones that we're going to soon release, like, hey, you can use this. And then what's next? Our idea is to start working with Unity as well, compatibility with Unity, Tecla, uh, Grasshopper, Forge. Like, being the platform, the platform being agnostic makes us really easy for us to connect to whatever we want. That's that's the good thing. It doesn't take us like a lot of time to do it. And even like one client required us 
because we have a an FM software as well in our company that we are developing that is called UBIM, which we have been developing for a couple of years actually. And one client was requiring us to try to work with IoT and make a couple of experiments with uh, Arduinos. So maybe in the future, you're gonna be able to connect it to, to your toaster or something, like <laughs> hopefully. So then there's the market I just spoke a little bit about. Uh, Engine is gonna be free for you guys, but if you wanna sell like your forms, your processes or something, you're gonna be able to do it. If you wanna be like, give it for free to the community, that's really welcome as well. Um, what you're gonna be able to, say, to sell is first those forms, like basically it's just gonna be front end of the, of the, of the notes that you have behind. Good thing is you can sell it to anyone like any guy who, who uses Revit, Navisworks, even if he's not like a modeler, even if it's a PM or something, he's gonna be able to use those. Just run it and use it. Then the notes, you're gonna be able like, hey, if you created like really cool notes, you should be able to sell them if you want to. Like I really prefer a guy selling us uh, something than not even providing it to the community. So that's the idea. So, and that's why we also let you guys, if you want to give it for free, it's also allowed. And lastly, API connections. You have like really specific connections that you develop in your company and you think you can make profit of it. So you can do it. You, you can upload it and you're gonna be able to sell anything you want in our platform. Yep. Will there be any verification process? Yes. Yeah, it's not gonna be like, like for example, uh, I know, or I know it was like that Dynamo, you can just upload a node. Uh, no, there is gonna be like a couple of minimal requirements like security, um, some like images and some specific things. Yeah. yeah we, we, being the fact that it's a platform and that you're selling things, you, you, you cannot afford selling garbage. Then, uh, which is our develop, which is our development development roadmap? So, uh, on December we released the alpha, which was the first software for Navisworks that we are not continuing it right now. Then on January this year, like last month, we released the beta. We um, allowed our our people and our partners to use it. That way we got feedback and, and that's what we are developing in our current sprint right now. So on early April, so in around a month, we're gonna launch engine to the public. That's that's our idea. After everything is stable in May, the idea is to, to allow people to use the data storage. And then finally on June, you're gonna be able to sell whatever you want. Basically that's, that's the way we have um, created our roadmap right now. So look forward to the release on early April. You can just join the waiting list right now. If you access our website, you're gonna be able to, to join the waiting list. So as soon as we release the software, we are gonna deliver it to you. And then once you have it, you're gonna be able to just code. If you're a programmer, design workflows or create notes or just use it. Like you don't have to learn anything to use those forms and just click it. Uh, that's me and Pablo. We look so much younger there. But Pablo was not able to be here today. Uh, he's the uh, most, the, the, the smartest guy we have in our company. He's the, the, the guy who has been like the brain dealing with most of the technical stuff. So hopefully next time he's gonna be with us. Hopefully he's listening to us right now. Um, and then this is our website, www.engine.us. It's the one I've just showed you a couple of minutes ago. Uh, you can follow us in GitHub. Most of the code is gonna be uh, open source and it's gonna be uploaded to GitHub. So if you wanna join us, it's fine. It's really welcome. Or you can follow us in Twitter or our YouTube channel. Thanks to you guys to listening this guy with an accent. And if you have any other questions, 
This is your time. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, data that you'll store, uh, who owns that? Would it be people that are paying for you in the service, or is that something that you can manage on? We are going to own the store, basically, uh, because given the fact that it's an online solution, there are costs behind it, right? Like the storage, the processing, and and so our, our idea is we are going to cover those costs with the people just selling the stuff. That's that's our initial idea. So we are going to own the market. Yep. Yep. Um, do you show one case study for the network that you have? So usually we have a couple of models. Do we need to upload them on your website? No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, the way it's gonna work, let's say it's the first time you are gonna use Engine, right? Just gonna create an account, you lo log it, and automatically, you you can you're just gonna download a really small like antenna that's gonna be in your computer. So, let's say you wanna run like a Navisworks process in Engine, right? Engine is going to detect if you have Navisworks, whether it's installed or whether it's open or not. If it is not installed, it's going to tell you, hey, you don't have Navisworks in your computer, first install it. And then it's going to tell you, like, hey, you have Navisworks, you don't have Navisworks open. And if you have it and you have like 10 models, you will have to choose which model you want to run it. That's that's so you don't have to upload anything at all. So the files are local. Yes. Yes, that, that's the idea. You can keep your files local and continue working as you are working. And no installer, no anything. That's so it. What's being uploaded on the web page? If you want to, you don't have to upload anything. Like, basically, let's put it this way, data. Like, if you're taking um, some information from Navisworks to Revit, it's going to go through our website. But then, but it's not gonna be storage there if you don't want to. You can make it's just a process, temporarily. Yeah. So will Engine handle the different, say, years, I guess, like stuff. Like you're currently running Navisworks 2019. Someone else in your team is actually this is more concerned about that. Someone else in your team is still running 2015 for some reason. How well does the, will the code handle? For instance, that downgrade or Correct. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, basically, right now, we are just working with uh, Revit 18 and 19. And if like, they release Revit, for example, 2020, we're going to be working with that. And But there is no need for you to update or, or anything, as long as you have any of the versions that we are using. Uh, correct. Or Let's say you you created the API, you you're gonna be responsible for updating that. But it's it's on our side, not on the user side, because we know that's a pain and it's a problem. So we're taking that responsibility. Um, all similar related questions. Yeah. How would it handle connecting with your users and Revit there is no problem on that. It's just data. It's no. It's okay as long as the if we are like if we are compatible with let's say AutoCAD 17, 18, 19, 20, whatever. If you are using 14, yeah, it's not gonna work for sure. But if you wanna, if it's let's say right now, for example, we have um, Navisworks 2018 and Revit 2019. Yeah, it's no problem at all because just data and it's IDs or no, no, it's. It's not a problem that. Any other questions, guys? How many people can work in the same environment as on the same node, for example? Yeah. Right now, we honestly, we don't have a max amount of people. Uh, Probably we're gonna limit that in the future for a matter of not being super slow, but it's gonna be uh, at least 10 or 15 users for sure, which should be more than enough for a for a script, right? At the same time. Now you guys 
Yeah. Yeah. That supposedly that's that's the idea. The idea is like, let's say you have Navis works in your computer, and you're not even working your computer. Your computer is just turned on, right? And I have Revit in mine. We're gonna allow the user to ask for permission and use someone else's computer at the same time. That's our goal for the MVP. So you, you can save resources, a lot of resources there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not really, because like it cannot be live if it is not online. Okay, I think we're good to go. Thank you, guys. Let's see, do we have any questions from the audience? Also online. Oh, there are questions there as well. Yeah, obviously. Nope. Perfect. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> no, we don't have anything. So yeah, that, that's actually the reason why we move from the Dynamo user group, uh, computational design, because we can host uh, this more open environment and collaboration platform. So that's exactly the reason why we would like to have a speaker like him. So thanks again. And um, if you want to present in our event, you can directly go to the website and also submit the call for proposal, call for speaker, and just submit your request. So we're more than happy to enjoy it your presentation and uh, yeah hope you can join us uh, Friday we have uh, our team uh, that are gonna go there with uh, me Danny and also Dennis and other people so more than happy to join our team so see you there maybe bye <laughs>